The stories in this video are all privately written. If you'd like to help or share your own story, I would love to hear them from you. Before getting started, can we get 100 likes on this video? It really helps the channel grow. Until recently, I lived with my parents in a private house not far from the city. They were always strict and had difficult personalities, so we rarely had guests. The only friend of mine they could somewhat get along with was Alex. I had known him since first grade, and he was the only person I could trust in tough situations. Unlike my parents, who preferred to scold me for my mistakes rather than teach me not to make them, Alex was always ready to help and give advice. He had more life experience than I did, he grew up without a father, started working at 14, and even managed to go out with girls. I envied him, but not in a bitter way, I was happy for his successes in all areas of life. He had one misfortune, his mother was an alcoholic. She spent half of her alimony on alcohol and used the rest to buy food for Alex. Still, he had something I didn't have in my childhood, freedom. A year after he turned 18, his mother passed away, and he inherited her apartment. A week ago, he came to visit me. My parents went to the theater in the evening, so we had the house to ourselves for the next three hours. We didn't even think about having a party, knowing the trouble it could cause in Alex's apartment. Despite being 19, my father was firmly against me staying anywhere else overnight. So, when my friend suggested I buy a cheap apartment on the outskirts of the city, I welcomed the idea. My parents weren't stingy with pocket money, and I was good at saving, setting aside most of it for better times. I doubt I can buy a decent place with this, I said. You can, Alex smiled. Not only decent, but new, in new buildings. Funny, I said, sounding dejected. I'm serious, Alex said firmly. I've got it all figured out. Our neighbor did the same thing recently. He's living happily now. Your money is enough for a small apartment in an old five-story building on the outskirts. It was built back in Soviet times, the builders didn't level the foundation well, and a crack formed along the wall. There's mold, the heating system failed, and the building was declared unsafe and is set for demolition. The residents will be moved to new buildings. Are you suggesting I live in a dump that could collapse on me at any moment? I asked irritably. Relax, Alex cut me off. You'd live there less than a month, it won't collapse that quickly. And the relocation is guaranteed free. You'll get a two-room apartment in a new building. How's that for motivation? I told him I'd think about it and give my decision the next day. I needed to discuss it with my parents and mentally prepare for the purchase if they agreed. The conversation was long. I presented numerous arguments for the purchase and explained Alex's plan several times. After a considerable amount of time, my mother finally supported my idea, and my father followed, likely just to get me off their backs. But I didn't care, I was happy and went to Alex the next day. He showed me the sale that he found online. The asking price was slightly less than what I had saved. The seller turned out to be a reasonable young guy slightly older than Alex and me. He inherited the apartment from a grandmother he never knew, so he had no sentimental attachment and put it up for sale the day after inheriting it. The apartment was on the fourth floor. The iron door stood out against the shabby and graffiti-covered walls, but what lay behind it was no better, it smelled like neighborhood cats had spent their best years there. The wallpaper was peeling in places, there was a single dim light bulb instead of a chandelier in the hallway, and the kitchen window was cracked at the bottom corner. Luckily, it was summer, so surviving two weeks there didn't mean freezing to death. The large room had a balcony, an old TV, and a couch where the grandmother had died. We immediately folded it up and covered it with a sheet. We weren't particularly superstitious, but we didn't want to sit where someone had died. The second room had a wardrobe, a bed, 
and a nightstand. Well, it's livable, Alex smiled. Maybe I could live with you? I asked. The apartment is in my name, so I'll be relocated regardless. Here's the thing. Alex hesitated. I'm not living alone. Remember Alice from the parallel class? It all became clear. I'd have to live here. At least it had all the amenities, and the iron door securely protected me from the outside world. My conscience wouldn't let me go back to my parents for the night, and I didn't want to see my father's expression, seeing my helplessness and unpreparedness for independent life. In the evening, we moved my things from my parents' house, and Alex went home. For dinner, I only had tap water, so I decided to go to the store. The five-story building stood somewhat isolated from the other houses, making the trip to the store quite long. When I returned, it was dark, and the streetlights were on. I noticed a silhouette near my entrance. After hesitating for a moment, I decided to approach. Who are you? The silhouette asked in a woman's voice. I live here, I replied, turning away from the entrance door. The silhouette stubbed out a cigarette and came closer. It was a middle-aged woman, quite well-preserved for her age, but with a smoker's voice. Lydia, she said, extending her hand. Simon, I replied. How long have you lived here, Simon? I moved in today. And you've been here all your life? I'm not going anywhere. The bureaucrats think they can easily kick us out, promising new apartments, but we'll get a bed in a dormitory at best, Lydia said, getting chatty. But I'm not moving. I'd rather stay here, even if the crack runs right through the apartment. Are there many people living here? I asked out of politeness. No. Just me and Boris. He used to serve in the Navy, got this apartment for his service. Then his daughter and her family died in a car accident, and he's been alone here ever since. He lives on the fifth floor. We talked for a couple more minutes until another silhouette appeared in the darkness of the yard. His posture was straight, his steps firm, but a limp and heavy breathing gave away his age. Me, Boris, Lydia nodded towards the silhouette. The man stepped into the light. He was an elderly man with gray hair and a mustache. I extended my hand, but he didn't respond. His eyes showed worry. He was clearly troubled by something, but I didn't ask. Don't open the door at night, the old man said sternly. The door? I repeated. The old man didn't answer and hurried upstairs. Lydia and I exchanged glances, but there were no answers, so after a while, we went to our apartments. I don't know why, but the old man's warning about the doors puzzled me. That night, I locked the iron door with all the bolts and the door to my room with a small latch. I couldn't fall asleep for a long time, different thoughts were racing in my head, and the old man's words haunted me. Probably senile dementia, I thought and calmed down. I was awakened at night by a noise from the apartment above, as if something heavy was being dragged across the floor. Then there were heavy footsteps, another noise, and finally, something glass breaking on the floor. I got out of bed and tapped the battery with the strap of my watch. The noise stopped, and the rest of the night was quiet. In the morning, before heading to college, I met Lydia near the entrance and politely asked about the apartment above mine. That's Boris's apartment, she replied with a smile. Definitely dementia. Late stage, I thought, smiled at Lydia, and headed to my classes. The day passed as usual. After classes, I visited Alex, met Lisa, and spent the evening at his place. I returned home late. Under the streetlights, I saw a silhouette near the entrance again. How was your day, Lydia? I smiled at my neighbor. She didn't respond, just looked at me with a frightened expression. Did something happen? I asked. Simon, I don't know, her voice trembled. 
I just got back from work, was smoking here, and then I glanced at my window, and the light turned on, she gulped and exhaled, and then it turned off again. Maybe someone's there? I smiled. Come on, the house is older than both of us combined. The wiring is acting up. Want me to check? If it's not too much trouble, Simon, she said, a bit calmer, handing me her keys. I cursed myself for agreeing, but it was too late to back out. I had a gas spray with me, which gave me some confidence. The door to Lydia's apartment was closed. With a trembling hand, I unlocked it and quickly turned on the light. No one in the hallway, I checked the kitchen, then the living room and bedroom, empty. I didn't want to go back downstairs, so I decided to shout to Lydia from the window. She happily raised her head and entered the building. She offered me tea and to sit with her, but I politely declined and headed to my room. About an hour later, I was watching a series on my laptop. The window was fully open, and I could hear everything happening outside, from the voices of passing drunks to the sounds of distant cars. Suddenly, I heard a scream, a woman's scream. I jumped up and looked out the window, no one. Another scream. Now I realized it was coming from our building. It all made sense, and I started shaking. My whole body felt like a big block of ice for a moment, then a warm, ringing terror gripped me. Only Lydia could be screaming, I thought. But who could hurt her? Her husband? Does she even have one? She's 40 and single. Maybe an ex-husband? And if she didn't open the door, then where? I froze for a second. My eyes opened so wide it felt like they might fall out. My breath stopped. I hadn't checked the bathroom. The thought hit me like a hammer, leaving a mark on my brain. The stupor passed, and I grabbed my phone, hiding behind the curtain to see who left the building and, if needed, identify the perpetrator for the police. The dispatcher said a unit was on the way. The police arrived in ten minutes. No one had left the building in that time. Three officers rushed inside while one stayed outside. I waved to him and gave my apartment number so they could take my statement. Two detectives knocked on my door. They wrote down everything I told them and then invited me to Lydia's apartment. Her body lay in the bathroom. A trail of blood led from the bathroom to the kitchen window, as if she had tried to call for help or escape. The cause of death couldn't be determined on the spot. No wounds, just blood flowing from her mouth, and her fingernails were broken as if she had fought someone before dying. According to the officers, they had to break down the door, which meant the killer had access to the apartment. The detective's theory, the killer left through the attic and exited through another door leading to the forest on the opposite side of the building from my window. Sleeping alone was unbearable. I called Alex and asked him to come over. Reluctantly, he agreed. Lisa was staying at her place that night, so he was free. I didn't mention the old man's dementia to the police. What was the point? They'd start questioning him, and he'd probably just move a piece of furniture around in front of them, I thought. The night passed like any other. Around four o'clock, I heard the familiar noise and a faint, quiet voice then glass shattering against the wall and loud footsteps as if the old man was jumping in place. Five minutes later, it stopped, and I fell asleep. In the morning, Alex shared his thoughts on the night. Not only did you make me sleep on the floor, which kept me awake half the night, he said, but some idiot woke me up with his jumping. You heard it too. I smiled. That's my neighbor upstairs, the demented old man. Your upstairs neighbor? So, you have a crazy old man living here, and you made me come over and climb the dark stairs at night? What if he killed the woman? I flinched. Thoughts of him sneaking down to her, opening the door, hiding in the bathroom, and waiting for the defenseless woman to be home alone and decide to take a shower after a hard day filled my mind. Enough, I said. 
He barely breathes. He's not capable of murder. The day flew by. I had only two classes, so I returned home early. Lydia's brother came to her apartment. I met him on the landing and asked about Lydia's family. He said she had none and never did. She was unlucky in life. He lived in another city and came only for her funeral. I spent the rest of the day at home, watching a series, and went to bed early. My mood was bad. That night, the noise woke me again. This time, the jumping was more frequent and stronger, as if trying to break through the floor. Somehow, I managed to fall asleep. I woke up very early, Alex's words still in my head. Could the old man really be capable of such a thing? I decided to call the police. The unit arrived in an hour. They scolded me for not immediately reporting all the residents of the building, even threatening me with a criminal record. When I told them about the old man and my suspicions, the detective decided to question him right away. They told me to come along. As expected, they knocked on the door for a long time, but Boris didn't answer. The detective decided to break down the wooden door. Behind it was a well-kept apartment, with portraits of Boris and his family on the walls, but the old man was nowhere to be found. The bedroom door was closed. The detective knocked, silence. He ordered an officer to break down that door too. The last barrier fell off its hinges, and we entered the room. Boris is pale, bald, Thin body sat in a chair in front of a large mirror, surrounded by his gray hair, which was either pulled out or he had pulled out himself, and blood smeared shards of something glass. His eyes were open, staring at the reflection of the door in the mirror, looking directly at us. The detective called for an ambulance, and the old man was taken away. I stayed home, didn't go to college, called Alex, but he didn't answer. I felt lonely and terrified. At night, I locked all doors up and windows, slept with a lamp on, and somehow fell asleep. At dawn, I opened my eyes, staring at the ceiling, thinking. Suddenly, a noise from above, jumping and running around the apartment. Morning jog, I thought. The realization came a few seconds later. I jumped out of bed and called the police. Time dragged on, the noise stopped, and I heard the police car arriving. They searched the apartment, no one. I packed my laptop, money, and passport. A policeman agreed to stay with me until I left, so I dressed quickly. In my panic, I forgot where I had thrown my mobile phone, so I had to call it from the home phone, which I had never used before. On the way to Alex's place, the detective told me the results of the old man's autopsy. He had been dead for at least three days. That means he was killed the day he warned us about the doors. I stayed at Alex's place until evening, while he was at college. When he came home, we decided to take three of our friends and retrieve my remaining things from the apartment. The street lights were just coming on as we approached the building. It was a bad idea to go in the evening. As we neared the building, I glanced at my windows, the light flickered on and off, and I nearly fainted. I don't remember how we got back home, I just remember yelling for everyone to leave that place. Now I live with Alex, waiting for the building to be demolished. Recently, I found a missed call from my home phone. I threw away the SIM card along with the phone. It's no longer my problem. It's 1996. I'm 16 years old and still a student. For breakfast, I have a slice of black bread drizzled with sunflower oil and sprinkled with salt, along with a glass of tea with sugar. It's the tastiest thing I can eat all day. For lunch, I'll have leftover nettle soup with pork bones from yesterday, and for dinner, boiled potatoes. My mom and dad both work at the same factory, where salaries have been delayed for three months, with the promise of payment as soon as possible. We survive as best we can. My father, an engineer, 
moonlights as a loader in a store in the evenings. My mother, a personnel specialist, sells pirated audio cassettes at the market on weekends, fearing her colleagues will find out. Our family is struggling, but there's no atmosphere to spare. On Sunday mornings, we gather around the table for our meager breakfast. Mom asks Dad, can you get us anything good from your store, even just a can of condensed milk? He sighs, it's tough when people pounce as soon as they see anything. You should see how chaotic it gets. I bring out the cans on a small cart, and old ladies swarm me, pushing and fighting. I end up pulling the empty cart out through their heads. And for some reason, we all laugh as if we've heard a joke. Breakfast is over, and it's time for all of us to go to our side jobs, dad to the store, mom to the market, and me to the newspaper office. Back then, I worked as a city newspaper delivery boy, the only way to earn some money and help my family. I had to strain my brain not to mix up the addresses, not to forget or confuse anything. On Saturday evenings after school and early Sunday mornings, I loved a heavy bag with fresh issues of Gordok, like carrying the weight of my own problems. At first, this job seemed like an adventure, covering the northern part of the city, checking off addresses on the list, I imagined it as a game. But over time, I grew tired and just wanted to finish delivering the papers, get my pennies, and go home. I had already covered three districts and expected to handle the rest in about 15 minutes, but it turned out there was a new address on my list, Litnyaya Street, House 12, Apartment 115. Just one subscriber. And I had to go out of my way to deliver a single copy? I had no idea where Litnyaya Street was. I thought I knew the whole city, but I had never heard of such a place. Passing by the street vendors on Ispitali Avenue, I saw an old lady selling vegetables from her garden, cucumbers, onions, dill, parsley. Granny, do you know where Litnyaya Street is? Just go past the hospital to the end, and you'll run into it, she answered. Thank you, I said, understanding where I needed to go. Son, are you delivering papers? Give me one to read, and I'll give you some cucumbers. Oh no, I have to account for every copy. Your cucumbers look great, I buy them myself, but I have little money. Sorry. I walked down the street to the medical facility and headed to a place I had never been before. The appearance of Litnyaya Street didn't quite match its name. As soon as I stepped onto it, the sun disappeared behind a cloud. There were hardly any green trees, the old lindens stood dry waiting to be cut down. No one planted flowers in the flower beds, and even the grass was sparse. Around me were identical houses, concrete boxes with dark windows, and not a soul on the street. My bag was almost empty and no longer weighed on my shoulder, but my legs were tired from endless climbs and descents. We couldn't even dream of smartphones with GPS, such technology didn't exist even in science fiction books. I had to find the address by looking at the signs on the buildings in this endless concrete maze. In the depths of the courtyards were tilted swings, rusty hockey goals, and an old sandbox with a board that had fallen off, nails sticking up. Not a single child on a Sunday. I thought the local kids didn't want to play in such a shabby place and ran to other streets. Stop, someone said behind me. The voice was so low and commanding that I got scared, thinking it was one of those grim guys who force you to empty your pockets. Though I had nothing with me but the bag on my shoulder and a few newspapers, I still feared those thugs. I stopped and looked back to see something scarier than a street thug. People with such faces don't exist. He had grayish turquoise skin, a long hook nose that extended to his chin, thin lips, black shiny eyes without whites, and thick eyelashes. He wore a black windbreaker with gray stripes, his head covered by a hood, black sweatpants with three white stripes, and cheap sneakers. It wasn't unusual to meet someone in such an outfit, but that bluish-green face, those bottomless eyes, that nose like Pinocchio's, only pointing down, not forward. 
I didn't understand who was standing before me and what he wanted. Who are you? The stranger asked in a hoarse voice, barely moving his thin lips. He didn't blink, his long thick eyelashes remained still. I, I deliver newspapers, my words sounded guilty, as if I needed to apologize for being there. And then two more in black tracksuits appeared beside him. They had the same faces, sharp noses and black eyes without whites. They surrounded me in a semicircle. My brain refused to find any explanation for what was happening. I just stood there, looking at them, trying not to show my emotions. Show us, the first one commanded. I opened my bag, showed all three its contents, and slung it back over my shoulder. They stayed silent, staring at me, pressing with their silence, and it dragged on for so long. I didn't know what they were waiting for or wanted. From the tension, I felt less like a person and more like a mistake, an accidental object that ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. They remained silent, and that silence was scarier than any direct threat. Finally, one of them turned and walked away, and the other two also dispersed. I was left alone in the center of an empty courtyard, surrounded by concrete walls. What did I feel inside? Terror. It seemed I had seen something I wasn't supposed to see. I had was a building with the number 12 barely visible. The right address found itself, but I wanted to leave as soon as possible. But I was a newspaper delivery boy. If I didn't put the fresh issue in the mailbox, they would make me come back. I had to do everything quickly and get out of there. Hey, hey, someone called from above. Are you bringing me a newspaper? Can you bring it to my place? I can't walk well. I involuntarily looked up and saw an elderly man with sparse ash-colored hair on the third floor balcony. The sight of an ordinary person brought me back to reality and I realized I wasn't in another world populated by some nose freaks. This was my city. Okay, coming. I shouted back and went to the entrance of the nine-story building. As I climbed the stairs, rational thoughts began to come to me. Maybe I had just seen things. TV constantly showed scary faces, even the logo of the TV company was frightening. And every Friday they showed horror movies, which I never missed, a nightmare on Elm Street about Freddy Krueger with burns on his face, critters about furry-faced space monsters. And a few days ago, they showed Dead Cop, where zombies were made from corpses. The faces in that movie were so horrible that you'd never want to dream about them. Recently, the newspaper wrote that these horrors affect the psyche. I was just tired, my nerves gave out, that's why I saw those freaks. I tried to convince myself of this, but deep down I felt it wasn't true. Those nose guys were too real and tangible. The apartment door on the third floor was ajar. I didn't hesitate and walked in. The elderly owner, in an old robe, was limping painfully towards me through the hallway. Hello, are you Gal Kim B.I.? I asked, recalling the name and initials from the list. Yes, yes, Boris Ivanovich. Thank you, he said, taking the newspaper. I dreamed of subscribing, but I don't have a TV, the radio works poorly, and I've reread all the books. Now I'll at least know what's happening in the city. Boris Ivanovich, why is your door open? Aren't you afraid? I asked, hinting at what I had encountered. The elderly man continued to smile, but his eyes showed sadness as he replied, I'm always afraid. But we can't close our doors, it's the rules. Maybe I was young and naive, but I knew there were no such rules where you couldn't lock your own door. But as I left, I noticed that every apartment door was ajar. The following week, I walked around like in a dream. The impressions of what I had seen on Letnyaya Street did not fade at all, and I wanted the weekends not to come. But soon it was Saturday evening, and I was leaving the editorial office with a full bag of fresh issues of Gorodok. I couldn't refuse this job, there was no other, 
and my family rely on me. The list included that address, and looking at it made me shudder. I could go to Letnyaya Street tomorrow, but it was better to deliver the newspaper to that man right away and have peace of mind. Passing the medical facility, I watched the sunset, but as soon as I stepped onto Letnyaya Street, all the bright colors disappeared. Sunlight didn't reach this area, a solid gray haze hung over the rooftops. I walked through the courtyards and saw them again, those guys with turquoise skin. Several figures in black tracksuits stood by the old swings, and two more stood under the entrance canopy of one of the buildings. They differed in height and build but had the same faces, long hooked noses and black eyes without pupils. They stared at me intently but didn't approach. I already regretted coming back here. Sometimes ordinary people pass by. They avoided the sidewalks and constantly looked around. A woman clutched her bag tightly, and a teenager darted from tree to tree, trying to be unnoticed. The local residents looked terribly scared. From somewhere in the windows came desperate cries, someone was sobbing uncontrollably. And on one of the balconies of the twelfth house stood Boris Ivanovich. It seemed he knew I would come today. He didn't meet me in the hallway but waited on the sofa in the room. Come in for a minute, the elderly man asked. I went in and placed a fresh issue of Gordok on the table by the door. Thank you so much, the owner said with a smile. I've been waiting all week. I'll read the newspaper myself and then give it to the neighbors since no one else has a subscription. You're welcome, I replied quietly, looking back at the hallway, not wanting to stay there. Are you in a hurry? Want some tea? Boris Ivanovich offered. I just brewed some Indian tea. Listen, I don't understand what's going on here. Who are these long-nosed humanoids? I couldn't hold back my question. The elderly man's face changed instantly. He clenched his teeth and said, Quiet, don't talk about them. I bit my tongue, but it was too late. The doorknob in the hallway hit the wall, and they barged into the apartment. Well, here we go, Boris Ivanovich sighed resignedly, then quickly moved to the edge of the sofa and whispered to me, Sit down, look at the floor, and don't move. In fear, I did everything as he said. Three of them entered the room. Their strange faces showed no emotion, but their eyes gleamed with a devilish black fire. One of these guys kicked a chair, I flinched, but the apartment owner sat still, staring at the carpet. The freaks knocked books off the shelves, opened cabinet doors, pulled out drawers, and dumped their contents on the floor. Within a couple of minutes, they turned everything upside down and then left silently, slamming the door. The apartment owner stood up and hobbled through the room. Every movement expressed pain. Groaning, he picked up the fresh newspaper from the floor as if it were the most valuable thing in his home and returned to the sofa. What were they looking for? I asked quietly, looking at the mess. Nothing, just mocking, Boris Ivanovich replied. My bag lay on the floor, newspapers sticking out of it, and I thought it was time to go, but I couldn't move. I was still in a daze, and the elderly apartment owner whispered to me, I'll tell you quietly, they're called Lantuki around here. They didn't used to be here, but then they came, and now we live like scum. They arrived and do whatever they want with us. We can't lock our doors, we can't talk about them, we can't do many things, and for breaking the rules, they punish us. They can take away children or lock someone in a tight cage. And look at what it took for me to go to your office to subscribe to the newspaper. Boris Ivanovich pulled back his robe and showed me his leg. I covered my mouth with my hand. It was horrifying. His leg was pierced in three places from knee to ankle with thick long bolts tightened with nuts. His shin was swollen and dark purple. They did this to me, as an apology, Boris Ivanovich said. You need to see a doctor, I replied. Not allowed either, the man hit his leg under the robe. 
Now I clearly realized I never wanted to come here again, even if it cost me my job. Something terrible was happening in this area. I stood up, picked up my bag, and prepared to leave. You're not coming back, are you? The apartment owner asked sadly. I don't know, I replied, and the man began to plead, you're not from here, they don't bother you. Please bring me the newspaper, there's hardly any joy here. Come next week, bring the newspaper, and leave. If you want, don't even come up, leave it in the mailbox, and I'll somehow get it. I can give you some money, I have a little stashed away. I didn't promise him anything, left without looking back. This street reminded me of hell, like a separate world distorted in a broken mirror. A woman passed by, almost bald, with only a few dark patches left, and the skin on her head was red, her hair had been ripped out, and her eyes were filled with despair and silent plea. On a bench sat a man in dirty clothes and wet pants, his hands nailed to the boards, unable to stand up. The man's empty gaze showed no emotion, as if he had lost all hope. These people were punished for breaking the rules, the Lantuki were real sadists, keeping everyone in fear. I wouldn't have thought I want to go back there. But what would happen if Boris Ivanovich didn't get his newspaper? He probably couldn't call the editorial office and certainly wouldn't come to complain in person. I could just forget about him and not go to that dangerous area, but my conscience gnawed at me. The following Saturday, not understanding myself, I was walking along Letnyaya Street again. No one was in the courtyards, and no one waited for me on the balcony of the twelfth house. I could just put the fresh issue in the mailbox, as my job didn't require delivering the newspapers to the door. But I went up and knocked on the unlocked door, then entered. Boris Ivanovich, I called, turning my head towards the kitchen. And there sat one of the Lantuki. He stared at me, tapping his blue fingers on the table. Suddenly, the apartment owner appeared in the hallway. He seemed to have aged ten years in a week. His face was pale, he didn't smile, and barely dragged his leg, holding onto the wall. Oh, you brought the newspaper, thanks. I glanced towards the kitchen and asked the owner, how are you? Oh, so so, he replied, taking the fresh issue of Gorodok from me. Now I'm not alone here, they assigned me a neighbor. I looked at the Lantuk and said, hello. Don't, Boris Ivanovich whispered. Don't talk to him without a reason. Come on, come on. He pushed me towards the door and went out with me. What's your name? The man asked, holding onto my shoulder to keep from falling. Yura, I replied. Yurka, take this. The man pulled a key from his robe pocket and placed it in my trembling hand. I'll go in, and you lock the apartment. Got it? I'll take one of those bastards with me to the afterlife. The afterlife? I repeated in horror. Go, go now. Boris Ivanovich pushed the key into my palm and mumbled as a farewell, and thank you for coming. You're a good guy. This was a goodbye. Locking him and the lawn tuck in the apartment, I knew I wouldn't have to come here again. My newspapers would be useless to the old man. I hid the key under the doormat, fearing other Lantuki would search me and catch me in the act. I thought I'd never know what exactly the elderly apartment owner planned, but as I walked away from the entrance, I saw a familiar window glowing with the orange light of a fire. Then thick black smoke poured from Boris Ivanovich's balcony. No one screamed or called for help. The unfortunate resident of Letnyaya Street made his choice. Maybe I should have tried to talk him out of it, come up with something else, escape, or find a way to drive out the scum. It was too late to think about it, and I left that area, repeating to myself, Lord, forgive me.